My guest today on the Test Podagogy podcast is David Epstein, author of the New York Times bestseller, Range, How Generalists Triumph in a Specialised World, and a Distinguished Journalist. The central argument of the book, as you may have guessed from the title, is that high performance comes not from early specialisation and single domain focus, but from a more general sampling approach to education that nurtures cross-domain skills. David, hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Was that a fair summary of the book, do you think? Do you want to give us uh, your version of the sort of the, the, the headline, if you like, of, of what the book tries to argue? That, that was definitely a fair assessment. I mean, in, in most simply put, it argues that um, we overvalue specialization, particularly early, and undervalue generalization. The, the way I sort of thought about the book as I went through it, is obviously it goes from sports and music and the arts to science and technology what I thought was sort of the guiding theme for me was that sometimes things that you can do that give you, you know, the the most rapid short-term head start can actually undermine your long-term development. And I thought that was sort of the pattern, whether it was in education, whether it was in sports, whether it was in uh, scientific research that, that sort of ran through everything in the book. Although that would have been a very unwieldy subtitle. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's interesting that you started with this, with the sport. And I know that's your background because, you know, you were, you were um, sports illustrated, but, it was the argument made for a specialization approach was made using sport and and you've demonstrated in the book by using the likes of Roger Federer but but other examples as well but that you know it only really works in a very strict rules-based sport and even then there are problems is that fair to say yeah the you know the way this came about was sort of a little bit out of my own uh confusion um, so it was the science writer at Sports Illustrated, and I got interested in um, my science background was in like the I was training to be a geologist in my in my past life, um, and I would look at the expertise literature because I wanted to write about developing skills, and would notice that there were camps that found that you know with hyper specialized narrow experience and head starts people got better, and others that found that not only did that not happen, but they would often become more confident, but no better with this kind of specialized practice and, and sometimes even inflexible. Uh, so they could get worse in certain ways. And I couldn't figure out how to reconcile these areas of research. And then to my good fortune, I, I ended up having lunch with Danny Kahneman, the um, uh, psychologist who, who won the Nobel Prize for essentially illuminating cognitive biases. And, and he, he pointed me to work that suggested that the difference was uh, the domain characteristics that people were working in, if they were in these so-called kind learning environments where you have rules laid out, your next steps and goals are very clear, uh, they're repetitive patterns, work next year will look like work last year, you get feedback that's quick and accurate, then those are more amenable to this kind of specialization. If you're more along the spectrum toward the so-called wicked learning environments where next steps and goals may not just be handed to you, rules may not be clear, patterns may not just repeat, rules may change, feedback may be delayed or inaccurate and work next year may not look like work last year. Those are the areas where the specialized practice can often backfire and make people limited or, or sort of inflexible. And so it was sort of uniting my own, you know, my own confusion of why do we see uh, people getting better with this hyper specialization in certain areas and not others. And it turns out it has to do with the characteristics of the domain. Um, and, and we're often, our most famous examples are often coming from like the kindest learning environments you can imagine like chess and golf are, yeah. are sort of the most frequently cited in, in best-selling books about skill development golf is like the epitome of the kind learning environment right everything's laid out nothing ever changes you're not dealing with any other people or anything you know the weather may be involved obviously but uh it, it's, it's sort of this perfect feedback cycle and the problem i think is that golf is fine as a sport obviously but in some ways, a uniquely horrible model of most of the other things that humans want to learn. And mm -hmm. so I think the fact that we use that as a point to extrapolate from uh, is, is a real problem. This, the same goes for, for chess. You know, the grandmaster's advantage in chess is based on knowledge of repetitive patterns, such that if a competitive player didn't start uh, studying those patterns by the age of 12, their chances of reaching international master status, which is one down from grandmaster, uh, drops from about one in four to about one in 55. But, but it's because of those repetitive patterns that it's also so relatively easy to automate, right? So if you're in the areas that are based on those kinds of repetitive patterns, you know, where hyper-specialization works the best, you may not want to be there that much longer because those are sort of the, easy, the easiest areas to outsource to computers. 
And you make a good argument in the piece that the vast majority of us, if if not, you know, almost everyone is going to end up in closer to the wicked learning environment than the kind learning environment because the nature of the world of work is that it's an interconnected space. Like, you know, you need you have specialists, but those specialists even then are are guys with number of tools to their bow if they're going to be successful. That is. That's right. And and also I think it's changing more uh rapidly. So everyone is being forced to have sort of multiple careers. If you look at, you know, there's a million proxy measures you can look at for this. But for example, you know, in in say 70 years ago or six, 60 years ago, the lifespan of a Fortune 500 company was about 60 years. Now it's less than 20 years right? because the turnover of companies and, and the, the rate of change of the kind of work we do is faster and faster. And I think we've seen, um, you know, certainly in, in, in the United States, some of the social upheaval that occurs when people, when, when people were used to a system where you have a discrete period of training followed by a discrete period of working, you know, and that's, and, and that's how it works. And that's not where we are anymore. And so I think people, people sort of feel like uh, the promise that was made to them uh, is, is broken when they have to sort of learn to do new things. It's, it's, an, it's an issue because our education system, you know, a lot of the Western education system comes from Taylorism, the science of management efficiency, which, yeah. which worked quite well, I think, for a largely industrial economy where people did face kind of the same type of work over and over and over. Uh, but that changed a lot more rapidly than it's possible to kind of change an education system, I think. And so I think we're seeing some of the, the pain of the lag there. It's interesting in the book that uh, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, section on how education in, in, in Russia Russian and Ukraine and how that broadened the village's, actual, the village's actual way of thinking so that education was just sort of an emancipatory force in the sense that it moved people from concrete rule-based thinking to a more conceptual, abstract way of thinking. So in its essence, the argument is that education should be should, be, should produce generalists. Is that broadly correct? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I think, I think that's broadly correct. And what the, the work you're talking about is when, um, you know, in the, in the Soviet Union, when there was a move to uh, suddenly take these remote villages that were like subsistence farmers and herders and, and group them into collective farms and sort of modernize them, it really changed the cognition of the people that worked there. Uh, such that they became more generalist thinkers. Like they had been, you know, very good at, at a certain small number of tasks in the past, but then when they were forced to work in interdisciplinary ways, uh, they suddenly had to start transferring things they had learned, right? Taking knowledge and applying it to situations that they had never quite experienced before and coordinating with other people. And it, and it basically unlocked their ability to think abstractly, which is ultimately the way that you learn from things that you haven't experienced, right? Mm-hmm. And we all... In, in modern work now have to be able to learn from things that we have not directly experienced. And it turned out that this kind of facilitating abstract thought is what allowed people to, to basically do that and become better learners who could transfer knowledge to things that w- weren't only something they had directly been involved in. I think the interesting example is where the, the villagers had to group linens or fabrics by, by similar characteristics and the 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 villagers who'd had more education or had more experience were able to do so but those who hadn't couldn't think of any way that the different fabrics could be grouped it seems amazing now to think that that wouldn't be possible it's it's totally totally wild i mean one and that gets at one of sort of the 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 major differences of those who had not been forced to kind of engage in, in abstract thought, which is that they didn't classify things essentially, right? Like when they, when they were given different colors and these were even people who worked like in weaving, right? They dealt with yeah. colors all the time. They would make different groups every time. So they were totally arbitrary. First they would say like, you can't do it. There's nothing similar about these. And then they would make sort of arbitrary groups. Whereas the people who had been exposed to modern work or some school that required classification of thought, right? We use classification of thought all the time. Mm. Um, you know, like I, I'm, I have a toddler now and I think of like, even when I'm showing him in a, in a book, you know, he, one of his first word was moon and the moon, it's a crescent in one book and it's a circle in another and it's yellow in one and white in one. And then it's this other thing in the sky. And he has learned to abstract that now, where if I show him a moon that he's never seen before, it has enough characteristics that he's abstracted that he can say, that's a moon. Right? Because he's, he's now getting used to thinking in these classification schemes so that he can identify things with certain properties, even if he hasn't seen them before. 
And that was something that was totally foreign to them until they were sort of forced to uh, think in a classroom setting and, and to uh, operate with other people and try to teach other people tasks uh, that they didn't know. The whole idea that you were talking about there of this, uh, with the example of your, your toddler is that there is a skill set that, that is cross domain, that we can, we can take knowledge from one area and apply it to another area. Mm-hmm. Um, that's quite a controversial idea in, in the UK at the moment, where there, are, there is an argument that skills specifically is, is domain specific. Uh, you know, you could write, just because you can write an essay in English, it doesn't mean that you can write an essay for history, for example. And there's an argument that, of course, you can take examples from, from other fields and apply it. You seem to be down firmly on the side that actually there, you know, there is a Swiss Army knife of skills that you can use cross domain. Is that correct? Definitely. I mean, and I mean, I think there's, we, we all do transfer all the time. Right. So I think it's a it's a question of the degree of transfer. We are constantly facing like if you're a a, a math teacher, the whole goal is to give people certain numerical skills that they can then apply to to problems they haven't seen before. Right. Otherwise, it would be totally useless yeah. if they just you could only, you know, and so we're, we're constantly doing transfer. I mean, reading is a transferable skill, right? Identifying contextual clues. So I think it's a question of the degree of transfer. Um, and I think transfer is, is difficult and far transfer is difficult, but there is, there's no question that it occurs and that it's possible. I mean, I think this can happen for the high level skills like um, uh, kind of numeracy that allows people to evaluate the news quite quickly. So one of the things I kind of advocate is helping people learn uh, estimation skills because it, it helps them evaluate kind of nonsense numbers in the news very quickly. Um, but, but it can happen in much sort of, sort of more typical ways. So One study that came out too recently for me to get in the book was done in uh, sixth grade classrooms in the U.S. in about 60 classrooms that were randomized to different types of math learning. And some of the classrooms got blocked practice where they get like problem type A, 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 followed by problem type B, 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 and so on. And they, you know, they progress quickly. They're happy. They rate their learning highly. They rate their teachers highly. The other classrooms were randomized to interleaved training, right? Where they got, it's like as if all the problem types were thrown in a hat and, and drawn out at random. Yeah. They're frustrated. Uh, their progress is slower. Um, they rate their own learning more poorly. They rate their teacher more poorly. And then when test time came around, where now everyone's facing problems they haven't seen before, that group that was frustrated, instead of learning how to execute procedures, was learning how to match a strategy to a type of problem. And they blew the block practice group away. It wasn't even close. Like the effect size is on the order of taking a kid from the 50th percentile and moving them to the 80th percentile. Okay. And, and all I really did was mix them up so that they had to create abstractions mm-hmm. that they could then transfer when they saw problems that they weren't familiar with, right? So it kind of echoes this, this classic finding in psychology. I think this is breadth of training predicts breadth of transfer, which is the, the more diverse the problems you, you face in training, the better will be your ability to take knowledge and apply it to situations you have never seen before. Uh, That's what so gives rise to the um, brilliant chapter on analogies and this, this, this ability that uh, we have to take familiar elements and apply it to unfamiliar situations. And there's, there's a great interview with one of the, the leading academics in this field in the book. And you didn't, it's one of those things where it, it sounds simple because it's been pointed out to you, but you don't actually realize till you read it quite how often you do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so I think the idea is just a question of the degree of transfer. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I think there's, I think it's not necessarily easy, but I think there's no, you know, if, if we're going to say that transfer is not possible, then you almost might as well like give up on <laughs> it's, it's what, it's what we're all doing. Right. We're all having to tackle like, unfamiliar problems, just a question of how, how far the transfer goes, I think. And that's a more kind of specific question. And we sort of um, skirted around it at the moment, but the, what we're sort of talking about here is, is, is to be enable those analogies, to enable those that, that as far transfer as we can get, what you, just, what you term as a sampling approach is needed so that, so that we don't sort of lock ourselves in a silo and, and just learn one thing that if we sample broadly and, and, and in, in some relevant depth, we can create more experience, if, you, if, you, if I can term it like that, that we can apply to future problems. Um, do you want to just give us an overview of what sampling looks like in sport? And then 
how that might transfer to a to a classroom or, or a school an education setting. Sure, since I sort of first got interested in this um, in sports, it was kind of uh, a surprise to me, really, uh, when I was looking at um, the literature in sports science to find that future elite athletes, like I assumed they would be the early uh, specializers. And uh, instead, what I saw was that, it, in fact, in, you know, and I put like two pages worth of citations because people always like are hesitant to believe this <laughs> in, in the book from all over the world, from all different sports. Um, and what it finds is that the athletes who go out, there's tremendous individual variation, first of all, but what the athletes who end up becoming elite, almost the vast, vast majority have what scientists call a sampling period where they do a variety of activities that can be a variety of sports, uh, you know, it can be dance, rock climbing, whatever, lots of different ways of using their body, lots of unstructured time where they're self-directed. Mm -hmm. Uh, they learn this variety of, of sort of uh, skills, so-called physical literacy. Uh, they learn about their own interests and abilities, and they actually systematically delay specializing until later than peers who plateau at lower levels. And that was kind of a surprise uh, to me, that they learn these sort of general skills that scaffold later technical knowledge, and they also learn where, where they best fit and where their interests are. And, and I think that sort of um, something conceptually along those lines played out in a lot of the different domains that I was looking at, right? Like when I looked at technological creation, it was uh, the people who had worked in the most different technological domains as classified by the U.S. Patent Office, in this case, who were like merging things from different domains who would make the biggest breakthroughs. Or in, I mean, on the other end of kind of the, the on a more subjective end of the spectrum, comic book creators, the, the ones who made the biggest breakthroughs were the ones who had worked in the, not who had the most experience or the most specialized experience, but the ones who had worked in the largest number of different genres. And in both cases, again, these people had to get out behind early on because as they were accumulating this breadth, it just looked like they were behind, right? Until they, until they zoom ahead. And so I think uh, that not, not uniformly, I think there are some areas where um, this sampling approach, uh, well, there are two factors to it, right? There's, there's the one, there's the match quality, which is how does somebody find where they best fit? Because it, it turns out that they're fitting your interests and abilities turns out to be incredibly important to uh, someone's productivity, their sense of fulfillment, um, and, and, and their staying power, basically. How gritty they look it depends on how good of a match quality fit they have. We can talk more about that if you want. And the other issue is having this broader toolbox that allows you to synthesize things and pivot from solutions that uh, you know, may work one day but don't work the next. Uh, and I think sampling... Um, enhances both of those capabilities. The problem is it just looks like getting behind, right? And we tend to be more, particularly in education, I think we tend to be more oriented toward, for, for totally understandable and well-meaning reasons, um, toward interventions that produce results now, right? So like in the United States, the most famous early academic invention is called Head Start. And it boosts, um, you know, test scores like right away. The, the problem is, in a recent uh, study that aggregated the results of basically 60 different programs like that, it found that there's a fade-out effect. So the way that they get those quick boosts is by teaching so-called closed skills, you know, like algorithms, or teaching things quickly that everyone else will learn anyway. So yeah, there's a catch-up, yeah. right? And so if you want to get the fastest boost for a student, basically you teach them something that they're going to learn on their own anyway, implicitly. And so the long-term effect fades out. And so I think there's this tension between needing to see results right now and actually, you know, doing things that are in line with sort of the best principles of long-term development. And that's a very difficult tension. Uh, you know, I think I was with one kind of a, a charter school system in the U.S. called the KIPP schools. It's become very famous for getting, um, you know, kids from very low socioeconomic status in, into college. Mm. And they were saying that they, they look at all this research and they believe that these sort of broadening horizons and, and problems solving skills will, because the, the, the problem they've had is the kids are not often still not getting through college, right? These are very disadvantaged kids. Yeah. Um, and so they want to broaden their horizons and broaden their skills. The problem is they're saying they are knowingly taking a hit to their short-term test scores to do that because they're not like drilling the algorithms for kids the same way. And so they're trying to find this balance of, 
keeping our short-term test scores at a certain level so that like we're still very attractive and get good media and things like that versus doing what we think is best in the best interest of getting our kids through a higher education, basically. I think that's the kind of a fundamental tension for everyone in education on one level or another. I think that's true. I think as well, um, I know from reading some stuff in the US that it's similar to here. I know the Heckman principle has, has had some, uh, taken a bit of a beating in the last couple of weeks, but um, there is this notion that if we intervene earlier uh, to boost apparent performance on literacy and numeracy, we have better long-term impacts. The argument of those against that is that if you take away that broad sampling play-based approach in the ages two to seven years old, for example, you're denying them loads of unseen skills and loads of unseen cross cross sort of cross domain skills at, at a cost, and and the prediction is you will get a fade out. And but that doesn't seem to be changing policy over here. We're still getting a really interventionist approach very early, despite some of the developmental psychologists saying. You, know, you should probably leave these kids alone till they're about seven years old. Um, in 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 your view, is, when you transfer this to education, so let's take the sport example. When they are sampling, are we getting a interleaved retrieval practice approach to similar skills? I mean, if we're in golf, are we doing? Is the sampling most useful when it's in relation to hand-eye coordination or, or some, some something that's similar that can be applied in golf, or does it not really matter what the sample is as such? I think it, I think it, it, it does matter somewhat. And by the way, speaking of up to age seven, there was an OECD report recently that showed that kids tend to, by age of seven is when they start like mentally restricting uh, what they think their possible careers could be. So I think that's oh, wow. kind of an interesting, interesting thing to find. Yeah. Um, and I'm putting that in the, in the, it's in the afterword of that's added to the paperback that's coming out like right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, so I think if we look at, I think arguably for golf, um, I think sp it's kind of surprising for such a popular globally popular sport. There's a real dearth of good science on golf. Um, but I think the available evidence suggests that early specialization, um, may work in golf. I think, yeah. I think you could, I think I could make about equal arguments for or against it in golf based on the, the research that's available. Um, but when you look at the so-called attacking sports or what sports scientists call the attacking sports where you have to anticipate things. So this would be, you know, volleyball, um, football, uh, American football, whatever, where, mm -hmm. where things are happening so rapidly that you actually have to be um, uh, adjusting before they get to you. Because, you know, using just your reflexes would be, would be way too slow. So you're judging, uh, this is a whole, a, a whole interesting topic on its own, but the biggest difference between elites and novices is their ability to look at the arrangements of bodies or, or flying objects on a field and see what's coming before it happens, essentially. Hmm. Um, and it, it looks like doing multiple different attacking sports is almost sort of like, you know, like growing up bilingual in the sense that it primes you to be better able to learn any subsequent one going forward. And, and that data that I've seen is kind of specific to those attacking sports, um, where it requires this anticip anticipation and judgment and novel problem solving. Uh, but again, I think that's much more similar to, um, you know, the kind of things we have to do in the world where we have to do novel problem solving and, and different from golf, the kind learning environment where you can do the same thing over and over and over again. And again, I think the, the more specialized educational approach was uh, very reasonable when we had economies where people much more often had, again, the discrete period of training followed by a discrete period of work where they essentially do a similar thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And that's also why you saw way less lateral mobility in those economies because people were facing similar problems over and over. So specialized experience was really important and it was hard to move laterally into that. Now we have a you know, creativity and knowledge economy with massive lateral mobility. So everyone's having to, to do some novel problem solving in their careers. So if we, you know, in your view, and you've read all this science, how does education look? I mean, at the moment in the UK, we have a primary system that's broadly cross-curricular, led by numeracy and literacy. So, you know, numeracy and literacy are, are hit hard so that children can access the curriculum, essentially, and they have that basic tool uh, to access, you know, life, if you like. But then beyond that, you have this cross-curricular approach where everything is sort of merged into one and then they hit the age of 12 hit hit um secondary school which is your high school and suddenly everything becomes in a silo so you, you cross curricular approach 
fades out and then you get specialization for GCSE, which is your 16 year old exams, specialization for A level down to three subjects. And then you go to the university and you're down to one subject. Is that, I mean, in the book, it would suggest that pathway is, is perhaps misguided. I mean, you, you cite a really interesting uh, example, I think it was called applied, you know, something around the general science, was it? Um, where you have this sort of general course at one of the universities that seems to make students perform better. When do you think specialisation in the education system is, is appropriate? How much specialisation? And is it different for different people? Yeah, so there are a couple of questions in there to, to, um, that I want to address. So one of the things, specifically in England, there was a, a, a study in the book um, by an economist who looked specifically at England and Scotland and over a certain um, uh, period of time uh, during which those the higher ed systems there were were quite similar during his study period, except for um, in England students had to specialize a little earlier because they had to a, a pick a particular course of study to apply to for university. And in Scotland, they could keep sampling longer if they wanted. They weren't forced to, but if they wanted. Hmm. And his question was, who wins the trade off? The earlier, the late specializers. And, and what he saw was that the earlier specializers they jump out to an income lead because they have more domain specific skills. The late specializers, when they, they get out behind, but when they do pick, they've sampled more things. So when they do pick, they get a better fit or better match quality. And so their growth rates are faster. And by six years out, they fly past the early specializers. So again, it's this, this issue of um, the head start sort of seemingly undermining long-term development. And meanwhile, those early specializers start quitting their career tracks in much higher numbers as time goes on, presumably because they were made to pick so early that they more often made poor choices. So I think aside from even the content, there's this match quality argument for, um, for delaying specialization. When it comes to the content, um, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't think, you know, we're not going to overhaul anyone's education system overnight. There's so many competing interests. It's such a big system. But I think there are things we can do, uh, you know, with just sort of reforming things a little bit, like thinking of numeracy, right? There's a, there's a college course I talk about uh, in the book called Calling BS, you know, not that that should be like mark the little kids or whatever, but they have some great case studies online where they'll take like a news report and, and sort of, um, you know, read it for certain context and say, well, how can you apply numerical thinking to, to tell that this is nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we could have sort of um, education that's, th there's one approach that I think is actually kind of, uh, kind of promising where you could take anything, you know, some news report, some area of scientific research, some period of history of Italy or something, and, and make uh, some of the numeracy and literacy and things like that revolve around that topic so that someone is getting an interdisciplinary experience of a topic and understands kind of what that's like. I mean, that's like by far the, you know, I, I went to grad school in science and by far my best science education has come as a writer because instead of studying this one you know, even as a writer, I figured out that some of my scientific research was nonsense, which I didn't even know when I was a scientist. <laughs> um, and my alumni magazine didn't decided not to quote me on that when I told them. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. And uh, so it's because I've taken these questions, like in my first book, you know, balance of nature and nurture and developing a sports skill. In the second book, how broad or specialized to be and when, and just try to come at it from every different disciplinary area I can think of, education, sports, music, you know, science, whatever, firefighting. Um, and, and that just, I felt has enriched my thinking in ways that nothing else I've ever done has. Sort of taking this one question and trying to look at it from every, examine it from every possible angle I can, and you start to realize how things kind of fit together, uh, what angles you might be leaving out. Um, and I've seen there's an approach uh, you know, a, a sort of a burgeoning approach to doing that, to just like picking some topic. And I, and I think that, that that could be really fruitful because I think you could do that without sacrificing um, numeracy and literacy. You can just kind of revolve around a topic uh, and show how this sort of interdisciplinary um, work could, uh, could be executed instead of where it's like, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever. And a kid is like su supposed to just change on a dime to some totally different topic. <laughs> and somehow retain, you know, what just came before, I think is not really according to some of the, the best principles of pedagogy we, we know. So I, I would be interested in seeing that kind of approach where we bite off topics and then apply the skills to, to that topic. And what, one more thing you mentioned uh, that I just want to touch on is a college course where people um, 
you know, get this that I wrote about in, in the chapter on analogies where people get this kind of diverse education. Mm. That's called the Integrated Science Program at That's Northwestern right. University. And the interesting thing about it was I spent some time with this woman named Deidre Gentner, who, a psychologist who is, you know, arguably the world's expert in using analogies to solve unfamiliar problems. Because sometimes if it's a really novel problem, you only have analogies because like nobody has solved it. Uh, and she created this test to test students at, at Northwestern and their ability to solve, do, solve novel problems in their major and, and then in other domains outside of their major. And the interesting thing was sometimes the problems were very similar structure but students would only be good at solving it in their major, even though, even if it was like the same data, it just had like a different veneer on it. They yeah. were better at solving it in things where they were familiar. And so that was the pattern was students were good at solving things that looked like they were from their major and not so good at solving things that were more interdisciplinary, except for the students who are in this integrated science program where they have no major. They just have a bunch, they take, they're exposed to all the different sciences and how each of the different sciences kind of approaches problem solving. And so they kind of have lots of different minors as, as we call them. And those students did well in problem solving in general, like across the board, they were able to take that knowledge and apply it to things they hadn't seen before. The interesting thing was, as I went around and asked her colleagues, Dr. Gentner's colleagues, what they think about the integrated science program, they would say, well, those kids are getting behind because they don't have a major. And I'm like, here you have the world's expert. In, in this very important form of problem solving, saying here are the kids we're doing the best with for this novel problem solving that's really valuable in the real world. And her own colleagues saying, yeah, but we don't really like that program because those kids are getting behind. And so I think that sort of is, testifies to some of the psychological barriers uh, to the idea that, that doing anything other than forging straight ahead in specialization can actually be good for people. Do you think that comes down to depth? Because I guess the argument that we have in, that some make in this country is that if you go cross-curricular, um, if you go into disciplinary, you lack the depth in certain subjects. So if, if we specialize, you know, if you have a specialist history teacher, you have your two hours a week, you go deeper and deeper into history and you can, you know, you have a greater understanding of history. Whereas if you try and take an interdisciplinary approach, you are getting more of a surface um, experience of that, of that subject and there's there's undoubtedly some protectionism there from subject specialists who love their subject that's understandable but their argument is it goes beyond that to you know if everyone knows a bit of something no one's very good really good at something so you have this you have loads of generalists but no one who's really knows the detail what would you say to that argument i think it's i think it's a valid argument i think part of the issue like i was describing northwestern is just that the professors in the chemistry department and the professors in the English department don't really care what the other are doing, right? So they just only see their own turf. Um, but I think, that's, I think that's an argument. I mean, I would argue that studying history in the absence of, say, numeracy or uh, science history also is, is lacking, you know, is really lacking in depth in certain areas, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think you can sort of argue that either way. Um, that said, I think we need... I think we need depth, but to use myself as an example, just because because it's easy. When I started grad school, I learned a ton of didactic information about Arctic plant physiology. Okay, <laughs> that's very specific information, so I knew a ton of that. Um, what I didn't know was anything about how science should work, which is why only as a journalist did I later realize that I had done science in a poor way, such that none of the thing, nothing I did should you know even still in peer reviewed journals, but. It, is almost certainly false positives, right? And now we have this thing in science called the replication crisis, mm -hmm. where it turns out that most scientists had no idea how science should work because they were going straight into where lots of famous findings are not replicating. And mm -hmm. so um, it and, and turns out they were never true because of poor methods, mm -hmm. uh, where, where we're going straight into learning this very, very detailed information without having first learned how to think. And I would argue that's totally backward because that information is more easily findable than ever. If I were studying today, I, I wouldn't have even bothered learning that much Arctic plant physiology. I just would have looked it up every time I needed it because it's so yeah. easily accessible now. And what I needed to learn was, was how rigorous research works and how to approach questions and, and what had been done before and what questions were unanswered. And so I would say we're, we're often kind of getting this backward and we should, um, you know, we should do what I describe in the book like the chess centaurs where the human computer partnerships are the best at chess. We should outsource 
the stuff that's easiest to outsource to computers, which is that didactic information in, in many cases, um, and, and teach people how to think, because that is something that if they don't get it, um, you know, I think they're increasingly unlikely to get it once they're in sort of the heads down focus of their, their daily job. Do you think the reluctance for us to sort of do that as a society is, is sort of two pronged? One, that uh, it's very difficult to assess it uh, in, a, in a very easily numerical way, you know, a mark scheme, you know, a mark scheme to, to look at that sort of interdisciplinary thinking is diff- it's tough. And also you've spoken about this d- delayed reward in the sense that these kids will look like they're behind for a long way. And we may not see the, re- the fruition of this. So th- there's a big risk there. You know, if we try this out on a group of eight year olds and we, we teach them in an inter- interdisciplinary way when they're between the ages of 12 and 18, we're not going to know perhaps till they're 25, 30 years old that, they, that it's worked. I mean, are those the two really constraining features on this, as well as ideology in general? Yes. I mean, right now, again, to go to that, if anyone wants to read the paper about the fade out um, effect of early education interventions, you can just Google fade out effect. And, and one of the lead authors is, is D. Bailey. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you Google those things, I'm, I'm sure it would come up. Um, and, and if you need anything more, is Drew Bailey at UC Irvine is one of the authors. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right now, what we're finding out is that when they're 25 or 30, we're finding out that the intervention didn't work. Not that it did work, right? So I yeah. think we, we, we know what, what happens on one side of it. That fade-out effect is like basically ubiquitous. Um, some of the social advantages stay, but I think we can, you know, that's not what those interventions are targeted for. And I think we can get those with other interventions. Um, when it comes to testing, like you said, it, that's right. It, this, things are hard to show up on a test. But I think that's a problem partly of the kind of tests we're using. So this is... There's something, uh, a a psychological bias that I guess has an America-centric name called the McNamara fallacy. It's named for the um, Secretary of Defense of the United States during the Vietnam War. And and what it means is that when you start measure, you you often make something that's easily measurable important because it's easily measurable. You're not measuring it because it's important. And and it's named for him because in Vietnam, he decided to say, okay, we're going to decide if we're winning, you know, if, if this is going well based on the enemy's body count versus our body count, right? Easy metric. So we can be objective. So based on that, we were always winning, right? We won by a lot. But of course, yeah. as we know, it was a huge debacle and society wasn't behind it. And there was nonsensical strategy and all these things. Um, and so I think, you know, in every realm of humanity, we have that, that bias where something that's easier to measure, we make it more important because it's easier to measure, because it feels like it's more objective. Hmm. But again, if you look at Deidre Gentner, she spent more time to come up with a clever test to measure something, you know, that has to do with interdisciplinary thinking and problem solving. And so I think that means we could do that if we wanted to. It just takes a little more thought. It's a little more difficult. Um, And so I think, I I don't think, you know, I don't think these skills are so soft that we can't test for them. Hmm. I think we're just, we're just not testing for them and it's not quite as easy, but I think we could. I guess it's a it's a teacher education problem as well because you know teachers are drilled in a certain way to teach in in a certain format and to, and they're you know the external accountability systems especially in this country are all geared to you know have you got your ten grades you need at GCSE then did you get your three grades at your A level to get into your higher education yeah. and it as you said earlier it's this this interconnecting competing forces on education to keep us on this track of a of a sort of specializing um you know direction where changing that is is a huge is a huge task the the you know the, 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 i think it's in, important to keep in mind too the disciplines like we break the world into disciplinary boundaries to make the world comprehensible right the world is it's like a necessary evil the world is not broken into disciplines so somebody has to reunite the world put it back together kind of at the end of the day and and i think you know and you're right i mean it's the amount of like when i hear sometimes certain complaints about teachers it's like it gives me a headache because the job is so there's so many competing interests Mm. It's such a difficult uh, thing. Um, there's, you know, this balance of autonomy in a classroom versus external accountability. There's a million interest groups that don't have what's best for the teachers or the kids necessarily um, in, in mind all the time. So I think it's incredibly difficult. So I think we need to take, sort of take baby steps. But I think, I think we can do that in ways um, 
that, that doesn't sacrifice a lot that, that are testable. Let me, let me give you an example. So when in one of the best things I ever learned in college, well, I took a chemistry class and every test, the professor would have one question on the test that was like totally out of the blue. One, the one I remember the best was how many piano tuners are there in New York City? I remember and, New York and forward, yeah. Chemistry <laughs> tests are like, that's not fair. You know, that was my first thought was that's not fair. And yeah. I think I guessed and I said uh, 10,000. Um, and what, you, what he was trying to teach us was this thing, this skill called Fermi estimation, because Enrico Fermi started the first sustained uh, fission reaction would, would ask this of people in his lab and he would do it, where instead of going, I don't know, 10,000, what I should have done is said, oh, how many uh, families do I think, you know, people are in New York, 9 million, how many people in a family, uh, you know, probably two and a half or three. And you, you, can, you can break it down to a bunch of different estimates. And none of them has to be particularly accurate for your end estimate to be in the right order of magnitude. Mm. Uh, I went through this in detail in a recent like newsletter I did that said my, not to like plug my own website, but whatever, it's, it's over there if anybody wants it. Um, okay. and, and that turned out to be one of the most useful skills uh, I've ever learned. I use it almost on a daily basis when I'm evaluating news. S sections of both of my books have come from reading a certain scientific study and saying, quick estimates, do these numbers make sense to me? No, something's wrong with this. And then, and then those turn into things that I investigate because the, the results don't seem plausible. And it's constantly, every day in reading the news, I'm like, this, is not, this isn't framed right. Or um, this, uh, you know, like just yesterday, there was a medical announcement about a pandemic treatment in the US. And right away, I tell in the press conference that the, the effect that they were talking about, how big the effect of this treatment was, was impossible impossible given the numbers we had right away. So then you start looking into it and I realize how they were sort of misframing it. Um, but that skill of Fermi estimation that I thought was silly is very easily testable and it's so powerful. Uh, and so I think we can teach stuff like that, that, that is part of numeracy. It is part of reading comprehension. It is testable and it is applicable across like any discipline. And I, I use it literally almost every day in everything I do. And I think it's a tool that's important for good citizenship. And so I think there are tools like that that undoubtedly transfer can be approached in an interdisciplinary way, can be applied broadly, and can be tested easily. Frankly, I think the um, I think the counter you get from some people here is it's an issue of timing, in the sense that uh, the argument is that you, that thinking is great. You get to a level of expertise where you have a broad knowledge, then you can apply it to Fermi questions, you can apply it to analogies, but that we need a ground, we need to secure knowledge first. So you need to go through a period of specialization in different areas up to a, a given age where you become very secure in your base knowledge and obviously that's contentious what is base knowledge but you know it's decided by someone you you've you've absorbed that that knowledge then you can get into this sampling then you get into the um you know the analogy thinking then you get into the fermi questions whereas in your book you look at it okay, well actually we shouldn't you shouldn't look at it as a uh, this then that approach that's right no i think that's absolutely right i mean and again the question of base knowledge is a whole different you know i think a lot of people would say well understanding what computer code is might be you know important part of base knowledge now but yeah. but I, I think there's i think the idea that those things are in zero-sum competition is more a function of what feels practical and and tradition like if you think of the sunk cost fallacy right this is this this cognitive bias that once you've once you've invested time or energy or whatever, emotion, anything, in something, you are more likely to overvalue it because you've already been spending it, right? So you're, you're, if you've spent a bunch of money on something, you're more likely to say, well, I might just, con men know this very well, that they start out by making small asks of people because once you've put in a little bit, you'll say, well, I've already gone partly down that road. Like, I don't want to waste the investment. I'll keep going. Um, and I think there's, there is that to some degree with education where if, if there was no system and we were starting tomorrow, would we argue the same way about things that are already in place? And, and I doubt it. I doubt it. But that doesn't mean that we should get rid of practical considerations. But I don't think we have to think about this stuff as in zero-sum competition, right? So my, the, the grounding you know, I had in certain sciences was enhanced by Fermi estimation. It, it wasn't separate. Um, and, and I think, again, I think we can, we can combine some of these approaches with and, – and there was an interesting uh, – a book to this effect called The Knowledge Gap that came out sort of recently that argued about combining some of these things around certain topics. That's where I took the sort of certain period of time in Italy where you can, you can look at it from all these different perspectives. Yeah. 
Uh, and there, there's so much knowledge to be had. First of all, I think it's hard to say what grounding in knowledge is. Um, I think number sense is, would be a really important one, right? Number sense, I think we, we often consider certain forms of arithmetic to be um, part of the fundamental knowledge that, that people need. And yet, I would argue that people need and often poorly use number sense in their everyday life and very rarely at all use arithmetic. So I'd say I think the pandemic sort of highlighted that a little is that there's some, you know, there's a, the population is supposed to be numerate. And actually what we see is a lack of functional numeracy, possibly an interpretation of, of probably what is, you know, relatively basic statistical information. There's a real dearth of understanding about what any of that means. It's, it's an incredibly big problem. I mean, I see this all the time. And one thing I realized, you know, once I had like a little bit of like the first time I had some disposable income to, you know, put in like a retirement account and you start learning about fees and things like that. I'm not sure if it works the same in the UK, but yeah. people get these advertisements. I've been looking at this for some of the ways that, that states invest their like teacher pensions, for example. Mm. And they'll put it in these funds that have really low fee. You're like, oh, it's only a, you know, 0.8% fee. And you say, well, that sounds really low. Great deal. Then you realize this is something that is applied on the principal every single year. And if you understand how compound interest works, that's an enormous fee, right? Mm. The enormous. But if, and, and you don't need arithmetic to that. You need like, to know the questions to ask. But what is that fee on? How does it work? How does it compound? And, and I get it. It, it makes me upset to think about the amount of value that people and public employees have lost because of a misunderstanding of, of those sorts of fees. And, and the idea that that wouldn't be that kind of number sense wouldn't be fundamental knowledge, but like, you know, drilling certain algorithms would be not that that's bad drilling certain algorithms is to me just, um, it just doesn't reflect the way, you know, the things that we actually have to do in the world, I don't think. And so I think we, you know, I don't think anybody would argue that we're in a good place with respect to the general numeracy of, of the public. And I, and I think it's clear that that gets taken advantage of um, quite a bit, whether it's from, you know, mismarketed dietary supplements or politicians uh, making, you know, poor statistical arguments. Uh, and so I think we need to think about the things that people are actually using. I, I don't think it means, I just said, don't, there's this, there's this one school of thought that that has a lot of followers that I saw that says, okay, don't teach any specific information, just sort of teach uh, how to recognize, you know, a certain type of writing or something like that. And then maybe you can look over here for certain information that I think is like too divorced from anything um, to, to feel usable. And so I think that's a, that's a whole other end uh, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to that extreme, right? I think you can do these things while grounding them in, in specific information. And of course you may have to give up something, but I think there's a lot, lot to be gained at the same time. Yeah, you see sort of painted an image of a, of a much more flexible education system where you may have sessions of subject specific teaching, but you also have application sessions of, of where these ideas can combine. And, and I think this goes back to sort of a question I had about the book is that does this end? Does that process of sampling ever end? Should it end? It, does it get to a point where you think, okay, you know, the sports guys obviously Federer picked tennis. Does that mean Federer never played table tennis or football or any of the other sports he did again? Or you know, in terms of timing, I mean, are we getting to fourteen and going, okay, guys, you can you can do some specialization now? Or you know, is sampling a way of life rather than a way of education? I guess it's a question. Yeah, I should say this is, again, not like to plug my own thing or whatever, but I, I address some of this in the, partly because I became a parent between finishing the book draft and its publication. Okay. So I, I put in, in afterward, um, uh, you know, I, I address sort of some of this thinking as a parent in an afterward and, and also put in some research that's relevant to people who don't have tertiary education. So mm -hmm. that, and again, that should be like, out like basically right now, but um it's certainly a way of life for me who has no idea what he's going to be when he grows up. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think the um, people are going to be changing. Very few people are going to have like the same career uh, for a long period of time anymore. So I think whether they like it or not, this, this sampling is going to be occurring. And uh, for the vast majority of people, you know, if you're a professional golfer, professional chess player, maybe not so much, but, um, and so I think, you know, that the process, 
like I think about it in the terms of the Dark Horse Project that I wrote about in the book. These, these were people who, who found their way to very high match quality, mm-hmm. work that they found fulfilled in, they were very successful in. And these were ranged from midwives to animal trainers to engineers, huge array of, of professions. And some of them followed this linear path where they specialized early, but it was the very small minority. Most of them took this approach where they did tried some work and said, this doesn't really fit me. Uh, I don't, I'm not as good at it as I thought. I don't like as much as I thought. So I'm going to take that knowledge and move to this next thing. They would say, instead of, they would say, here, here are my knowledge and skills right now. Here are the things I'm curious about. Here are the opportunities in front of me. I'm going to take this one and maybe a year from now I'll change because I will have learned something about myself or something else will come up. And then they just sort of do that repeatedly until they get to a spot that, that better fits them. Hmm. And in, in the afterward, I write about a sort of formalized version of that process that the U.S. Army started using because, you know, the Army, as I write about in the book, they started losing their best recruits when the knowledge economy started, basically, yeah. because yeah. those people suddenly had all this lateral mobility. And in response to that, this is something I only mentioned in a footnote in the main text, but now it's, it's expanded in the afterward. They started this thing called the talent-based branching program, where instead of saying, here's your career track, get up or out, they pair uh, these cadets with sort of a coach-like mentor, and they have them try one career path, and they reflect on how it fit them with their, with their coach. They keep track of their reflections in an online portal, then they try another and another and maybe two others. And so they, they get to dabble in different career paths. The research showed that they're often surprised by what they're good and bad at, that they're not very good at intuiting some of their professional skills and interests. And... 90% of the cadets who went through talent-based branching changed one of their top two career choices. And that improved retention of cadets where money bonuses had not, right? The ability to try to find better match quality. So they end up with a better idea of what their colleagues do. They end up with a better idea of their own strengths and weaknesses and interests and, and where they're going. And that's sort of a, that's the analogy that I'm kind of using as a model, both for myself yeah. um, and as a parent, right? Where Even if your goal were to create more Tiger Woods types or Mozarts, I think probably the best approach would still be a talent-based branching one where maybe you expose the kid to a number of things and maybe they run into something where they really lights their fire, right? Because the way we tell the Tiger story, like the Mozart story, is a little bit wrong. In both cases, the father was responding to the kid showing this very unusual degree of interest and ability, right? And then the father responded to it. And so even if we were, there's, those people don't get manufactured, right? And so I think even if we wanted to make more of those people, this kind of thematically conceptual, something conceptually similar to talent-based branching would be, be a good way to go because we know the returns to match quality are extremely high and you sort of accumulate breadth. Those, those dark horse, the people in Dark Horse Project, they didn't set out to say, I'm going to be broad. Mm-hmm. They set out in search of match quality. And because that took them through all these steps, they ended up being broad. And sort of, so that's kind of the model um, that I hold in my head for, uh, you know, for, a pro- for an approach that we should have. And I, I think part of the problem, part of the reason we don't do anything like that, is that we severely undervalue the returns to helping people find good fit, right? Um, and, and I think so. I think that's a big problem. I think that's an, an, a nice place to end. But before we go... I think it'd be good for us both to talk a little bit about Anders Ericsson, who who was the sort of godfather of specialization. You know, Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule was supposedly based on Ericsson's work. And in his later life with me, when he was in, I was interviewing him, he spoke about this, this lack of interpretation of his work. And I know you had something similar. So, I mean, do you want to finish by saying a bit about cause Ericsson's work's huge in, in the UK? education scene here you know deliberate practice this is how we should be teaching our kids do you want to say a, a few words about what Ericsson's work meant to you and and how you think he may have seen that being interpreted in the education sphere yeah you know first of all I, I was supposed to just before the pandemic I was supposed to join Ericsson um, in we were both going to go to Angela Duckworth's class Angela Duckworth most famous for research on on grit grit yeah um, and by the way Everyone should Google summer is for sampling Angela Duckworth. She has a newsletter where she wrote about the importance of sampling and how okay. it took her a decade of uh, sampling to find where she should apply her grit. And so I think that's important coming from the, you know, the most famous spokesperson for grit. Yeah. Um, but Anders obviously had a lot of disagreements with Anders. Um, but I think, you know, and he, and he passed away recently. And, and I think 
I think an important thing I want to start by saying is that I had tremendous respect for Anders. Um, our disagreements were incredibly generative for me and enriched my life. Um, and the fact that he was willing to engage in those disagreements, uh, I just, I, I value, you know, I think it's, it's the best thing you can ask. I think his work was, uh, so he, he, again, he's known as the father of the 10,000 hours rule, but he hated that yeah. moniker. Um, that 10,000 hours came from a study of 30 violinists who were all at a world-class music academy and the 10 best uh, in their, their retrospective estimates had pr- spent 10,000 hours by the age of 20 on average in so-called deliberate practice, where it's like very focused on error correction. You know, it's not improv um, and, and one of the reasons he didn't like the, the moniker father of the 10,000 hours rule was because um, the 10,000 hours, nobody, nobody in the study actually practiced 10,000 hours, right? It was an average of the top 10 people. Some went, you know, one went way over that. Some were way under it. And so it was just an average, right? If we look at chess, again, it it takes 11,053 hours on average to reach international master status, but some people have made it in 3,000 and some people accumulated 25,000 and still didn't make it. You can have an 11,053 hour rule, but it doesn't really tell you much about the breadth of, you know, human skill acquisition, does it? And so he was, he was upset about that because he never said it was a rule. It was just this range. That said, I think, you know, I think he bore some responsibility for that because the paper didn't have a measure of variance. So there was no way to tell, like it didn't, didn't have the original data in it. So there was no way to tell what people had actually done. Mm-hmm. So in 2014, um, in sort of a follow-up paper, when some of the data was shared, it, it showed that actually some of the top violinists had actually practiced less than some of the violinists in the next level down. Um, you know, which had been something that he previously said uh, couldn't, couldn't really happen, but that, that came out of his own data. And so I think, I think he made tremendous contributions in putting not only focus on practice, because I think most people can get better at most things than they think they can, mm-hmm. um, a lot better. Uh, he put tremendous focus on the importance of practice and on the quality of practice, right? Not just like mindlessly goofing around, but on 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 really being cognitively engaged with what you're doing. I think his focus on the importance of practice and on uh, the, the, the different qualities of practice will pay dividends in research for decades and decades to come and is incredibly important. What I think got lost in this overuse of averages was the importance of individualization and how uh, some people adapt way better to certain challenges than, than others and also the fact that in these wicked learning environments where they're less rule bound, the deliberate practice can actually backfire in the sense that it can make people very inflexible such that they're tailored for one certain thing. And then if they see something else, they, they sort of have problems. But he, he, I think he came around on that because in his book Peak, um, he says, you know, the tenets of deliberate practice are most applicable to domains that have these characteristics of uh, where, where, the patterns of success are known. Someone can tell them to you, preferably they can coach you through them. And so he says in it, um, let me see, I can, if I have like 10 seconds here, I think I can bring up, um, cause I think I put it in the remembrance. Um, I, I wrote for him. Let's see. So he says in the book, uh, that the techniques, he and his co-author, they explained for the first time that I'd seen that, that certain areas simply don't qualify, as they put it, um, including, as they wrote, quote, many of the jobs in today's workplace, business manager, teacher, electrician, engineer, consultant, and so on. And so that's a pretty big caveat, yeah. right? Just, and so I think his work's incredibly important, incredibly valuable, and I think it also comes with a very important caveat that, that he eventually himself recognized. And are you, uh, are you finished sampling now or is, uh, are you working on a new book for, for, <laughs> for nonfiction or on, educa- on education or have you got some other thing in mind? Honestly, I, I, I don't have a clue. I mean, when I was 16 years old, I knew exactly what I was going to be and what I was going to do. I was going to be a test pilot and then an astronaut. Of course, I did none of those things. <laughs> and the older I've gotten, the less sort of firmly goal-directed I've been. And I realized that my most important projects have come out of some unexpected interest, you know. Um, and, and so I'm going to trust that again, where, so I sort of, during the pandemic, I started this newsletter I call the range report. Um, and I've used it largely to sort of critique science in the news, but write about topics I think are interesting. Mm-hmm. And inevitably when I do that, I start to say, I'm actually more interested in this than I thought. And I start diving into some of the research. And so, uh, 
that's been happening through the writing of this newsletter. So I'm trying to trust that because every time after I finished a big story or a book or whatever, I say, well, that was lucky. I'll never get that, you know, interested in something again. Um, so I'm trying to trust that it will yet happen again because it, it seems to seems to recur. Well, I hope so. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.